Welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning for those of you who are in North America. Good afternoon, good evening for those who are joining from Europe and Central Asia. Welcome to this seminar of the Central Asia Program at GW, today featuring uh, the book recently published by Edouard Schatz, Slow Anti-Americanism, the Social Movement and Symbolic Politics in Central Asia. I must say I'm really happy to have this book launch organized with us because it's a topic that is very dear to me and I wanted to uh, uh, congratulate Ed for being able to write a piece that for once is looking at a big issue, something that is really global in the world, but with Central Asia, the case studies. And I think it's really great to, for all of us working on Central Asia to be able to show how much our region makes sense when we want to understand global uh, transformation. So Ed, congrats for this uh, 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 wonderful work. And we were all very happy to receive Emil Nasridinov as our discussant. We were thinking we have an American author writing about the decline of American influence. We want a Central Asian scholar to give his feedback and bring some local voices into that discussion. So thank you for being here uh, today. Let me briefly, briefly present our uh, two uh, speakers. So, as I said, Edouard Schatz is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Toronto. Before publishing Anti-Americanism, he uh, uh, published Paradox of Power, The Logic of State Weakness in Eurasia, and then Political Ethnography, What Immersion Contributes to the Study of Power. And Emil Nasridinov, our discussant, is Associate Professor and gra Graduate Program Coordinator with the Anthropology, Urbanism and International Development Program at the American University of Central Asia in Bishkek, and is researching and teaching on uh, migration, religion and urbanism. So it's a great team. I'm really happy to have you both here and to have so many people joining us for this fascinating discussion. Ed, I would like to give you the floor to make a short presentation of the book. Then I would like Emil to give some of his comments. Then I will give you the floor back to kind of responding to some of Emil's comments. And then we will open the floor for a Q&A. So I invite everybody to write your question comments in the chat box. And then I will moderate uh, the Q&A for the second uh, part of the, the event. So once again, welcome everybody. And Ed, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Marlene. Um, it's really great to be invited. Um, and uh, it's uh, thanks to everyone who's, who's come here today. Thanks in advance to Emil for um, what I'm sure will be fascinating and important con uh, comments. I look forward to the discussion that we, you know, generate. Of course, the, the conversation I hope will not end, you know, after an hour but we'll continue in other sort of formats uh, going forward. I will say one additional thing. It is, I remain in total awe. I don't know how many years it's been, Marlene, since you launched the Central Asia program, but I remain in total awe with what you're able to do with the service that you provide to, not just to community of scholars and policymakers, but I would say much more broadly, connecting people from around the globe in this weird moment that we're all living through. Um, those, uh, you know, we, we, we see that, we see how that plays itself out uh, in real time. But even before the, we all entered Zoom land, um, it, uh, Marlene was doing this sort of thing, connecting people and really to great effect. So thank you for all your hard work. Um, the, the book is called Slow Anti-Americanism, as Marlene mentioned. And the, the adjective slow is meant to draw a sort of rhetorical red line between what I see happening in Central Asia and what I suspect is happening in a lot of other world regions as well, though I don't do research on those other world regions, uh, on the one hand, and then how anti-Americanism is typically discussed. Um, the way that anti-Americanism is typically discussed is, you know, it sort of conjures up images of, uh, of impassioned mobs, uh, people burning flags, uh, dictators, you know, banging shoes or banging fists on rostra and, and, and so on at, in international bodies. Um, you know, the sort of evoking uh, a sort of passionate side, almost a precognitive sort of emotional response to what the United States is or what the United States does or what the United States represents. And what I see in the Central Asian context, and, and again, I suspect this is how it plays itself out in other places as well, we just don't normally look at it this way, is a much more slower, uh, is a much slower uh, process. Uh, 
the slower moving processes of change by which the, the cluster of representations that uh, the United States um, uh, comes to entail shifts over time. And the processes by which this occurs, it may not be particularly linear, they may not be particularly predictable, which makes me somewhat unpopular among some political scientists who are bent, you know, hell bent on prediction. Um, but that's what I see happening. A lot of secular processes, some of which are somewhat predictable, some of which are maybe harder to see the sort of, sort of end point to, but that's how it plays itself out in Central Asia. And so the, the focus of the book is the changing symbolic raw material that the United States, or as I call it, America, because that's the, um, the uh, often preferred rendering uh, in the region, that America comes to stand for over time and how that changes over time from, let's say, the late Soviet period, which is where more or less I start the story um, up to, you know, just a few years ago. The book, uh, the, the data for the book, all the evidence that I try to amass, it's a pretty eclectic sort of um, source base. It is, um, it, it ends before the Trump administration comes into power. Um, I don't think that what I found particularly would change, I suspect, but I haven't done the research on the Trump administration, or at least not in the same kind of fine-grained way. But I'm happy to, to, to chat about uh, what may have shifted uh, under the Trump administration or even after. Um, one of the critiques that you get of, or one of the, the assumptions that you get in discussions of anti-Americanism is that if you can't see how it changes bilateral relations between the United States and let's say country X, it must not matter, right? And so you get this in accounts from, you know, people like Peter Katzenstein and uh, Robert Cohane, who, you know, essentially say, you know, the burden is on uh, those who talk about anti-Americanism's anti effects to show that it has some kind of effect on bilateral relations or on America's standing globally. And that's a very hard standard to sort of, um, uh, to, to, sort of um, to sort of reach. And it may be the wrong one. And that's what I suggest in the book. The slower moving processes are much harder to disentangle. They're much harder to highlight, but I think they're, they're no less important. And it doesn't make these processes toothless. It just makes them something that we need a longer time horizon in order to begin to take stock of. So the bulk of the book, um, I mean, Emil will have some, some questions and some comments, I'm, I'm sure, but the bulk of the book deals with um, how this slower story unfolds. And, and the lens that I use in order to, um, in order to look at it is uh, the lens that some in the room may be familiar with. This is, the, this is the lens of social mobilization, social movement literature, right? So I look at different kinds of social mobilization and how social and political actors use the symbolic raw material that is the United States or America um, uh, as they try to pursue their own local political and social agendas. So the three interior chapters of the book, those are the sort of main empirical contributions. Um, I look at Islamist mobilization, different types of Islamist mobilization. I look at human rights actors and their activities and the ways in which they frame their efforts. And then I also look at labor mobilization, uh, particularly in, uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, and look at how they interact with different framing options. And so the story is what how does the shift in the image of the United States globally play itself out in how actors on the ground are able to tap into what is, what is often something resonant on the symbolic plane? I mean, how does that uh, symbolic raw material and especially the deterioration of the US image globally, a relative deterioration, right? And I should say, I should have said this at the beginning, we're not talking about a Central Asia, as most of you will know, that is massively and clearly anti-American. That's not the story here. The story is the rise of a, a significant degree of ambivalence about, the, about how people think about the United States and about what it represents. People, uh, even an individual, can think about it um, as a source of inspiration on one front, on one dimension, a source of frustration on another. Um, so, it plays itself out in quite complex ways, but social actors who are interested in framing their own efforts and their own uh, and, and achieving their own local goals will use this symbolic material differently depending on whether the image, uh, uh, broadly speaking, is positive or negative. Um, and this shifts the terrain. Uh, 
right, for politics and society, I would suggest, across the region. Not in ways that really fundamentally change bilateral relations with the United States. Again, that's not the metric that I'm using, though that is the metric that maybe some people in DC would be interested in, in entertaining. Because I, I don't think that, um, you know, over the short term, we can uh, make any kind of serious claims about how, let's say, Kazakhstani US relations have shifted because of the deteriorating US image. No, those kinds of bilateral relations are fairly transactional. Um, there is a power dynamic that doesn't disappear just because the US image is, you know, has relatively speaking deteriorated. Um, and so bilateral relations may not shift very much, but the, but the, uh, the, the actors that are empowered let's say in Kazakhstani society, and the actors that are disempowered in Kazakhstani society or any of the other uh, countries of the region, that will shift because of this shifting um, this sort of symbolic field, I would suggest. Final thing I'll say, because I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for, for you know, some, some good discussion, is that the, the end of the book tries to tackle the question of, you know, well, what can be done, right? Uh, what is to be done, said, a certain Vladimir Lenin, right? Um, and Chernyshevsky. Um, and, the, and the answer to that question is, um, is you know, I, in answer to that question, I offer what's both a modest, well, seemingly modest proposal. It's modest in the sense that uh, I make the claim based on some uh, survey experimental evidence that, that I used in, in the region. I make the claim that in a way the messenger matters more than the message. Right? And we spend too little time thinking about the credibility of the messenger. So if, for example, people in the United States, and this, by the way, probably could apply to other actors interested in framing the, their, own, uh, their own interventions and interactions with the region. Um, if they want to get their message across, they need to be credible. And so the story is one about how to develop the kind of credibility that would allow for the effective translation of, of, uh, of certain messages that would hit home on the ground. And it's modest in the sense that in a way we kind of know that, right? We know that, but it's also really only seemingly modest because it runs up against, because what it really would entail is serious commitment to, um, a, to language training, to developing cultural competence, to, to developing a, uh, a broad and deep cadre of people who are prepared to, um, to, to enter into this, ter this, this terrain of sort of public diplomacy. And public diplomacy is, I mean, we can have a separate conversation if people want to, but public diplomacy is challenging to carry out under the best of circumstances, even if it's very well funded. Um, and this is where things get quite challenging that the US taxpayer may have a limited appetite for very expensive programs with long time horizons, given what we know about the short time horizons that tend to dominate in US politics. So the, practic the practicality of this is something that one should talk about. But if I'm just looking at how, the, um, how this sort of politics plays itself out in the Central Asian context, uh, the evidence seems to suggest that it, it, it has shifted the, the terrain rather significantly and, and perhaps we should take uh, better stock of uh, what might be done, even if that's hard to do. So I'll just uh, leave it with that. And sorry, I went over 10 minutes, Marlene. I tried. That that's was perfect, Ed, and I didn't want it to stop you because you were presenting things in such a nice way and your conclusions are really important. So I wanted to give you enough time to give us the, the core, the essence of the book. Now I would like to give the floor to Emil for some comments, Emil. Thank you very much, Marlene, and thank you very much, Ed, and um, thank you everyone, Janet, also for uh, giving me this honor of discussing this book, you know, and uh, still um, on, on the way, you know, for, for, the, for the larger audience. And I would like to say, maybe just have my presentation in uh, a discussion in three parts, a little bit of a summary of the way I see the book, a couple of comments I have to, the, uh, to, to, to add, and um, just a couple of kind of uh, concluding thoughts on uh, a, a general reflection on uh, anti-Americanism. And uh, so the, this is a wonderful and very much needed uh, book about how Central Asian societies uh, shape the view of the United States. And just for the sake of time, I'm going to read from my notes. Um, and um, just a little spoiler, you know, in the book, um, so it's about the, the, um, the way the Central Asian societies see the United States and, and America. 
and in the book, you know, the two are not the same, you know, with America being a symbol that represents uh, much more than just uh, the United States, much more than just a country, right? And this is um, very interesting. So the author starts by asking the question whether anti-Americanism is the result of a clash of civilization, um, reaction to US policy, or um, electoral strategy used by the local politicians. And he proposes that these are the questions um, so these kind of questions are more on the end of high politics, and as such, they're not very productive, right? So instead, Ed um, is suggesting that we need to move down to the more grassroots level perception, and that the best way to do it is to look at America as a symbol, right? And to do this effectively, Ed argues that we need a new vocabulary um, that borrows from psychology, sociology, and other disciplines. But interestingly, he finds inspiration for the new vocabulary, not in the social science, but in geology, right? And he comes up with this very beautiful analogy with the geological process of sedimentation. Uh, so uh, the idea is that once sediment originates somewhere in the US right, or in other places around the world where US engages with, um, in various actions, it flows with the water down the stream of contemporary information channels uh, until it settles and sediments in new locations under the influence of numerous local forces and factors. And then the sediment then becomes a bedrock of local perception of America to be used by local social movements uh, to shape their view of America. So, and Ed then gives a historical overview of how Central Asia shaped its views on America beginning from um, the way it imagined to be, right, in the early 90s uh, to um, all kinds of disillusionments uh, of the late 90s and the geopolitics of the 2000s, right? And the empirical basis uh, is three chapters uh, about um, Islamist groups, about social protest movements and human rights NGOs, and about labor unions. And in my opinion, these are extremely interesting chapters. They provide not only um, the kind of uh, anti-Americanism explanation, but also give good accounts of the history and current situation of these movements. Uh, they are very informative and also analytical. And uh, well, my favorite is the Islamic chapter, um, very good account. Um, Ed ends this book with the recommendations which are based on the surveys he conducted with the team um, in the region. Uh, major strengths of the book are its focus on like one specific theme and one academic vision, uh, plenty of empirical evidence to work with, uh, creative and innovative explanation of anti-Americanism, and the discursive style of the author where he doesn't just put one perspective, but he always tries to offer and engage with alternative explanations and he is continuously waiting uh, various uh, explanations as he does, um, and he does this with a lot of integrity, yeah? So um, I highly recommend everyone to read it once it comes out, um, and, but also have a couple of comments slash questions, right? So firstly, Ed, I have somewhat ambiguous relationship to your use of um, analogy with the natural world that you borrow from geology, you know, about the water sediment and the bedrock formation. Um, on one hand, uh, this provides a, a very unique alternative perspectives on how, anti-Americanism evolves over time, and it helps to challenge the uh, more commonly held views of anti-Americanism as a reactionary politics, right, that respond to current global political developments. On the other hand, you know, I feel cautious about it because it's just too beautiful an explanation, and it can easily seduce us to try to see the world through its elegant, but still uh, limited framework, right? And it made me think whether um, uh, trying to stick to this particular explanation, you might have left out some important um, issues, debates, explanations related to anti-Americanism, just because they don't fit this model. Right? Uh, so uh, finally, uh, it also remi reminded me of uh, the origins of positivism in social science and the evolutionary perspective that uh, borrowed heavily from biology and such concepts as natural growth. So um, in my view, right, perhaps we live in the age where the speed at which the transformation takes place nowadays is so fast, like just think of COVID, right, that it makes me wonder whether this low anti-Americanism explanation can catch up with the like really fast uh, pace of change, right? Um, <clears throat> everything is becoming faster and faster, while you in your explanation try to slow, uh, 
us down, right, in trying to understand this. So my first request is basically to ask you to give a little bit more uh, justification uh, for you borrowing from geology, right, what it meant to you and how you came up uh, to using it and whether um, you think of such analogies as expanding or kind of limiting perhaps our perspective, right? Okay, secondly, I really like your um, three empirical chapters. Uh, they are extremely well written and have a lot of information and ideas to engage with. Um, and, um, and, and I really like the way that you classify different groups within chapters and also the different scales that you use to position these groups like uh, Hizbut Tahrir, uh, IMU and uh, Islamic Renaissance Party or Protestant movements and human rights NGOs um, in the process of their categorization, right? So while I was reading, um, I was trying to see the logic, right? I was trying to see your logic for choosing these three categories of social movements and, uh, and the logic of placing them in that order. And I was thinking maybe it was like from high anti-Americanism um, to pro-Americanism uh, and to no connection with America. And so while the first two categories, the Islamic um, uh, groups and the uh, NGOs, um, they kind of made sense. I have struggled a little bit with the third one, like with the labor unions. Um, I think one of the major conclusions that you're drawing from it is that they could have framed their visions through anti-Americanism, but they didn't. And basically, um, anti-Americanism is not there. So I have naturally struggled with the question of why then is this chapter here if it is not anti-American, right? <laughs> so finally, um, I was thinking kind of more generally, uh, there are so many other anti-American groups and social movements, and uh, why are they not included into the discussion, right? So this, my second request, right, is uh, to ask you to elaborate a little bit on the choice of social movements. Why these and not others? And more specifically, why labor unions, right? Okay, and finally, um, I think one of the major strengths of the book is um, that it triggers thinking about all kinds of explanations of anti-Americanism in Central Asia and all around the world. And while I was reading this, I was thinking whether um, what we observe, right, is something bigger than anti-Americanism, right? Uh, some kind of a global trend that we observe everywhere uh, towards conservatism and anti-liberalism of which maybe anti-Americanism is only a part. So I was thinking that maybe, you know, uh, maybe Francis Fukuyama, uh, jump to his conclusions about the end of history, uh, you know, marked by the end of communism and the victory of liberalism a bit too early, right? And that maybe it is the time for him to do a sequel. And I propose the next title, right? The return of history. Because um, if we see, if you use your approach of perceiving America as a symbol, right? And uh, we usually see it as a symbol of democracy, of freedoms and human rights, then uh, perhaps the biggest anti-American group today are the Americans themselves. Right. So, and to conclude, to conclude, like I would like to throw in a little bit of real anti-Americanism, right, and um, <coughs> add maybe just a little bit to the explanations, many explanations that you're using, right, uh, in the book. Um, and in comparison to other players uh, in the field, America is locally is like, I mean, one way to perceive it is all just about talk and no action. For example, if you look at Kyrgyzstan, Turks are building schools all over the country. They also built two universities. Arabs are building schools, hospitals, and entire villages for vulnerable families. Chinese are building roads. Germans are engaged in agricultural products. And um, even Russians, you know, are now committed to building 40 public schools. Um, Americans with all of their might built one university and uh, that offers ridiculously high tuition affordable only to the kids from wealthy families. Um, and um, and and and, and um, yeah, and, and so sort of there's this gap, you know, between uh, the talk and the action, and also the specific type of um, assistance that uh, U.S. provides in the region might be also one of the reasons uh, of why we um, we, we, we have uh, anti-Americans today. But this is just one additional third to the many explanations, uh, wonderful, interesting, and complex and elaborate explanation that you have um, in, in your wonderful book, which I highly recommend to everyone. Sorry I took too long. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Emile, for these great comments. Ed, I would like to give the floor maybe for just a few minutes to, to reply on, uh, to Emile, and then we will open the floor for questions. There are already a lot of them arriving in the chat box. Excellent. Um, Emile, I, 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 I love those comments. Those are absolutely fabulous. Really, um, really, I think, push me a, a lot in the most productive kind of way. So uh, thank you. Whatever we don't get to, it's not because I don't want to get to it. In fact, let's continue it when we meet in person, <laughs> you know, some fine day soon. Uh, let me tackle what I can and um, maybe I'll have a chance to weave in some answers later on when other, as other questions come in. So, um, right. So the, the, the question of the geological sort of metaphor, the metaphor of sedimentation, what was I trying to do and what are the limits of, uh, of that? Um, I mean, you're absolutely spot on. What, let me just give you my motivation for, for doing this. And, you know, as much as I sometimes like to um, criticize my home discipline of political science, I at some point am reacting to what political scientists uh, sometimes are preoccupied with. I mentioned the preoccupation with prediction. And I think that the, 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 the virtue of the, the, the metaphor of sedimentation is that it allows for some uh, kind of a loose prediction or a loose, you know, certainly an explanation, but there are many, many contingent factors, right, involved in how sediment, you know, arrives at a new destination, whether it becomes the bedrock in a new, in its, in its ultimate destination, and how that eventually can become, um, you know, solid and something, you know, as I, as I use in the book, to be quarried by future, you know, social and political actors, versus sediment that simply flows by and doesn't settle particularly anywhere and doesn't have any particular effect, may not change the course of the river, um, the metaphors, uh, you know, could, could continue. But um, so that was the first thing that I wanted to try to, to tackle, just to say that there are patterns, we can reconstruct what happened, some loose sense of where this all may be going, even though we recognize that there are many contingencies that we can't possibly um, predict in advance. The second thing, and, and I already mentioned this, is that I wanted to slow down our analysis, right? Um, I wanted to say that even if it's a meandering slow river, it may not be the Nile or the Amazon, it may be a, a, a very slow, uh, slow moving kind of process. It nonetheless can, have, can, 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 um, can uh, produce effects over great distance. Um, and, that's, and that leads to something else that you sort of uh, alluded to, uh, you know, the United States is, you know, for all of its involvement in the region, it remained mostly remote most of the time, with the exception of the, you know, the military um, campaign in, in Afghanistan and all the associated activities. For the most part, it was a pretty remote actor. It was, you know, it was hegemonic globally, but it was a distant hegemon, as I talk about it in the book. And I wanted to see how its distance might not have precluded its effects, right? Um, that is to say, you can watch how this, you know, sometimes slow meandering river can, can actually affect things, things downstream. So you're right, it's slow. Um, I wanted to focus on this because I think that we tend to, when we raise questions of anti-Americanism, and I don't think this is just my discipline of, my home discipline of political science, but I think it's probably the way we tend to think about the issue more generally when uh, in lay discussions of, of, of anti-Americanism, we tend to think about the immediate, about the faster versions, about the things that, um, that uh, bubble up quite quickly to our, into, uh, to our attention. And I, I think that we don't spend time on the, some of the background story, that stories that might make things, um, certain outcomes more likely and, and other outcomes less likely. So that leads to, you know, what this misses. And I think that, you know, of course it's, I mean, every book misses things. Um, I think this is clearly misses the things that you, um, that, that you highlight there. But I would say that, you know, the, the kinds of very fast interactions that you rightly describe as occurring today, right? You know, terrain can shift, discussions can, you know, events get beamed around the world, images travel. And I think that that process still happens against a backdrop of the slower moving processes that are also underfoot. Um, we know from literature on, you know, social psychology and even political psychology that people will, of course, interpret, let's say, any given event. I don't know, the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, right, comes to mind against the backdrop of their accumulated interpretations that have happened over time. And so it's the slower process by which those, those prior interpretations come into being 
that I think are really important because I don't think you can understand how they condition the, the interpretation of a given sort of much more recent event. Um, so recent, I, I, I would, I, I want to have my cake and eat it too, but in this case, I, you know, in the sense that I wanted to talk about the slow stuff and also the more immediate stuff. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, I focus really on the sort of the, the backstory that I think it helps us to make sense of the front story. Um, so much more here. You know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna just kind of try to weave in more answers to, um, to your, to your excellent comments and questions as I respond to things that are coming into the chat. Thanks, Emil. It's fantastic. Thank you so much, Ed, for, for your answer. Let, let's now just uh, um, open the floor to uh, the Q&A. There are already a lot of questions coming on in the, in the chat box. I just would like to give very briefly the floor to uh, Edil Baisalov, who will be talking here in personal capacity, but it's, of course, a topic that is dear to him. Edil, yes. are you here? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schatz, dear Ed. Uh, congratulations on the book, as uh, I really enjoyed reading it. And um, but uh, you know, I uh, would like to offer very briefly. You know, first of all, of course, um, uh, I take some personal offense. I mean, like uh, you saying that the NGOs were strikingly ineffectual one. You know. And uh, the NGO sector that received American financing was too weak to drive major political change. I mean, we know for the reality, I mean, what kind of political change, because I tried to understood. Uh, so you assume that the American funded NGOs were supposed to drive the political change that would be uh, beneficial to the uh, th that outcome was supposed to be positive for the U.S. administration. That's what I understood, you know. And from that, you judge uh, effectiveness or ineffectiveness. You know, for uh, uh, better or worse, there was considerable, considerable discussions of, of the NGOs and their role or our role in all the changes that continues to this day, you know. And uh, all these human rights and other things, they came uh, to be synonymous with some of the personal activists that you quote here. Very shortly, the other thing that you struck me uh, was when you say, uh, you know, like, as the US retreated, the Russia and, uh, and China just filled in. And of course, you talk about how Central Asia did not exit the media, um, the Russian media and the Russian influence sphere, Ruski Mir, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, don't you see that there were some, perhaps, some active efforts on some outside sources, uh, you know, uh, engaging and uh, uh, completely well-funded, well-organized uh, influence operations? Uh, and actually, I was uh, quite sur if, if you surprised. Can really Edil, if yes. you can reduce, because we have a lot of questions, I want to okay. give a well, fair thank share. Okay, I will, I will probably offer that in, in private capacity. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Edil. And, and to continue, Ed, I propose to collect several questions and then you can kind of answer in a different way and combine them differently. To follow what Edil was saying, his last points about the fact that there can be other type of NGOs well organized in trying to counter the, the US role, there was also a question asking you to comment the way the possible influence of outs, outside media sources that are uh, uh, trying to create an anti-American uh, sentiment. So the classic discussion about the role of potential media Russian influence in, in, in fostering um, anti-American feelings in Central Asia. So that's a kind of one package if I may say, of questions. There are questions that are more theoretical, questions that are more policy-oriented. I will try to do the theoretical one and then move to the more uh, uh, policy one. And then a question from our uh, colleague Eric Maglinchi asking you uh, uh, to clarify if the slow aspect of your uh, demonstration is on the causal side, the outcome side of both, right? What, is, what make it slow? Is that, uh, because the implication of the slow can have different uh, sorry, the implication can have different impacts. So what do you think has the, the reason for this kind of slowness aspect? So let's just take that for the moment and then we will 
then move to another round of questions. Okay, these are great. I mean, each of these each of these should be teased out. I think uh, you know an hour an hour per question sounds about right for me. I mean, these are sort of big and important important questions. I'll, I'll do what I can. Um, to Adil's question, thank hi Adil. Um, uh, so um, I. The, the part of the book that I think that you're referencing, and I, you know, I have it in front of me, but I don't, I don't remember specifically what you're referring to. But I, but you know, the the story of of U.S. funding of NGOs is a story of robust funding with a very, um, with with clearly, you know, U.S. foreign policy goals in mind, but also with a sense of, you know, uh, building building democracy, building civil society as a route to democracy. I mean, we all know the story. Um, at that point in the book, though, I think I'm uh, engaging the claim that essentially uh, Central Asian Kyrgyzstani civil society is nothing more than you know just a just a, just a U.S. funded effort. There's no organic civil society in in in, in Kyrgyzstan. That this is all basically U.S. Attempts at fomenting regime change, right? This is sort of the you know the Russian account that we or you know, the Russian government's account of you know the causes of color revolutions. There can't be anything organic. There can't be anything natural. There can't be anything local. And my claim is that the the U.S. while very capable of funding robust civil society and it has a it has had a huge effect, um, is not capable of determining outcomes right in the region because those are the those are more and you know lots of people have written about the various outcomes scott radden so, uh, you know among them eric mcglinchey as well you know the the um the the outcomes are really more in the hands of local actors right so i was trying to argue against some notion that this is all an an, an outside uh you know um, coordinated effort by the united states where the u.s controls uh the ultimate outcome um other actors, uh, yeah, there are lots of other actors. The one, I mean, Marlene mentioned, I'm not sure who asked the question, but it's, it's the right one. And Marlene has written uh, a lot more about this than, than I have and really effectively. So I commend you to her work with her colleagues on Russian media in Central Asia. Um, but there is a longstanding pattern by which um, Central Asians have historically received their information and their interpretations. And this is crucial, right? Because information is not just a, you know, a, uh, just the facts, it's the facts as interpreted, right? Uh, it receives them through, largely through Russian channels. And this is, you know, the, the sort of the history of, of Central Asia, of information flowing into Central Asia from the outside, and it continues, uh, continues to this day. I mean, obviously, there's a lot more going on there, um, there, and people these days can get their information from any, you know, range of sources. But if you're, trying to account for the broad patterns by which people imagine the United States and its role in the, in the globe uh, or its role in Central Asia in particular, I think you could do much worse than looking at sort of how Russian interpretations filter into Central Asian media. And I do cover that in, you know, at some length in, I can't remember now, chapter two, maybe it's chapter one of the, of the book. Um, uh, so absolutely, that's that's a, that's a good one. There are other actors that I don't really tackle, right? Um, at least not directly. At least not in any kind of sustained way. So you know, there's not much about Turkish influence. There's not much about uh, Chinese influence until the end of the book. Uh, Russian influence, you know, makes an appearance in the ways I've just uh, I've just described here. So a much more complex book, and I think one that would actually, you know, there's a lot of interesting literature now on competing efforts of public diplomacy, for example, right? You would want to take into account how people receive sometimes conflicting messages from multiple actors, right? Um, but even the slow moving changes, right? How do, the, how do these slow moving changes in some of the ways that Adil started to talk about, um, sorry, uh, Emil started to talk about, how do, they, um, how do they begin to play themselves out on, on the ground? So let me just turn to one comment that just by way of finishing this round, um, one other thing that Emil said, the, um, the claim often is the U.S. is all talk and no action. And, by, and, and Emil drew up, I think, properly so, the contrast between, you know, Chinese building roads, Turks building schools, right? There are concrete sort of things uh, happening on the ground that can be attributed in a positive way to, uh, to those different and various actors. As long as the schools are good and the roads continue to function, um, this is going to be received in a positive kind of way. And there's an if there, right? Because we do see outside actors in involving themselves in ways that are, 
initially quite welcome, but you know, over the long term, if, if the quality isn't there, then sometimes it can turn uh, into some into a liability. But that aside, I think that the question of the concreteness is is actually huge here, and the overpromising on the part of the United States is actually, I think, the heart of the problem. Um, if you go back to the sort of deep sense of disappointment that occurs in, um, you know, by the late 1990s and into the 2000s across Central Asian societies, so for some people deep and for other people less deep, depending on where you're located socially uh, within Central Asian society. Um, but the contrast between what seemed to have been promised by the United States, um, uh, even if not explicitly, right? And so, you, you know, the, but the, the understanding was that you know the uh, countries of former Soviet space would become normal countries, which meant sort of on the road to prosperity and freedom, and that already in and of itself is a bit of an uh, of an overpromise, um, and the U.S. didn't do anything in particular to ratchet down th the expectations um, about what would happen, and so not by design necessarily, uh, though I'm I'm sure that U.S. policymakers uh, had uh, pretty ambitious you know, uh, ideas in mind, but nonetheless, it, there is this gap between what is, uh, what seems to have been promised and what actually is, is, is done on the ground. That's at the heart of making, I think, credible promises in the region and delivering credible messages going forward. And I know we haven't had questions about going forward, but if, if I were to just offer one tidbit, you know, it may mean that on uh, issues of, let's say, protecting human rights, that a Biden administration or the Biden administration, assuming they care about this kind of issue, um, they may need to be very careful about what they promise versus what they can achieve, right? Um, narrowing that gap between action and, uh, and talk, I think is actually at the, heart, uh, at the heart of the matter. And Central Asians are not stupid. They can see this from a mile away, right? Promises that are not meant to be kept, that, uh, that uh, promises that haven't been kept, versus those that seem to, uh, seem, to, um, seem to have been kept by other actors. I'll just leave it there. Wonderful, thank you. So let's move to another round of questions. There was a question from our colleague, Baliha Sanghera, asking you about the extra symbolic or discursive aspect of social mobilization. And he was mentioning the case of labor movement in Kazakhstan that are arriving because of work and pay exploitation by US-based Chevron's network of subcontractors. So in that case, how the fact that it's a new US-based firm play in the, the, the kind of labor social movement. So how would you articulate what is the labor base and what is the, the symbolic value of that being a, a US a firm? And another question that is in fact quite related to that also from myself about how would you separate the relative decline of the US in terms of its international prestige and status with the decline of liberalism as an ideology and the kind of the changing nature of politics and the rise of this kind of conservative atmosphere in Central Asia. How would you articulate that? Great, okay. I'm not sure how much time people have, but again, another couple of hours should, should do it just fine. Um, Great questions. Um, the first one uh, about labor links up to Emil's uh, uh, good intervention on, you know, why choose, why choose labor? Um, so let me answer Emil's question and then um, shift to um, uh, shift a little bit afterwards. So the, the, the question is why, why choose labor? You know, I, I wanted to um, highlight in the, in the book that that this is not an automatic process by which the deterioration in the U.S. image results in certain kinds of, uh, you know, automatically so, certain kinds of shifts, right? I wanted to highlight how political actors on the ground have agency and they exercise that agency. And it's, it, that's a challenging thing to do, especially retrospectively, right? I'm not in there among, the, let's say, the labor activists um, in, in real time uh, experiencing or seeing or uh, laying bare their age. I mean, I'm just, I, that's not the work that I, that I did for this kind of project, though, um, though one could certainly try to, try to do that. But retrospectively, to reconstruct it is a bit challenging. So the way that I uh, tried to do that was, first of all, to emphasize that, the, um, that there's variation among Islamist actors, right? And so how they use the image of the United States is a moment of creative agency, right? Um, it doesn't flow automatically. 
good, you know, good, and by good, I don't mean morally good, I mean good as an effective social mobilizers will be effective at, in, 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 um, in marshalling um, the, um, in marshalling the symbolic raw material that's, that's available to them, but it's not, it's not guaranteed that they will. And so that's the story of labor, which uh, gets to the question uh, that was just asked. I, um, the story of labor is, is a story of, I think, a failure to tap into this potentially resonant symbolism, right? I think that there's plenty in the moment, um, in the post-Soviet moment, uh, whereby individual activists are very aware of the United States and what it represents, either through Chevron or through other, you know, subcontractors associated with it, or sometimes wrongly attributing U.S. influence where it doesn't particularly belong. But there's, there's an awareness among the activists, and you see this in their writings and in their postings online and in their, in their public comments of the United States. But at the same time, they don't frame their mobilizational efforts in, uh, with regard to others who might be experiencing, let's say, poor labor conditions, poor uh, working conditions, poor, uh, poor pay, or, or other things they might have grievances about. And this is one of the things that, that was puzzling to me. And, I, and I, I'm kind of with you, Emil, because I'm not sure I know the exact answer why they didn't use it. Um, I'll get to that in a second because it shifts to the, to the next question that Asel asked. Um, but uh, I, I think at some point it's a story of, uh, of, a, of a lack of imagination. Um, in addition to a story of risks, right? Um, because the labor that we see in Kazakhstan, and this is where we see a significant degree of mobilization um, on, the, on the labor side, obviously they operate in severe constraints, right? And um, uh, severe constraints in the sense that, you know, independent labor unions for all practical purposes don't exist. They kind of pop up here, here and then, but there, there's, uh, they're treated as, as sort of opposition movements, right? Rather than as movements for, um, you know, uh, championing the, 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 the position of, of ordinary workers in the oil sector or other kinds of sectors. So they operate under severe constraints. Their, their efforts are constantly undercut and they go into some of the dirty tricks that are played by regime by uh, local um, uh, firms or international firms in trying to make sure that people don't people don't really mount a serious labor challenge. So there are these kinds of constraints, but the claim that I make and, you know, uh, we can talk about more is that their efforts, what's puzzling is that they didn't actually try they didn't actually try to link their plight to that of other laborers experiencing similar things around the globe. Um, so that gets to a sales question about, you know, the moment that we're talking about, right? The decline of U.S. hegemony versus a, a broader decline of, of liberalism. Um, I'm going to assume that uh, a cell means a decline in political liberalism because I don't really see in the same way a decline of economic, you know, neoliberalism. Um, so there is a, there is a, um, I think it's impossible to disentangle these sorts of things, at least not through the, the lens that I've offered. So Estelle is asking the right kind of, the right kind of question. But, um, and so it makes it very, uh, it makes it very challenging for, for you know, to, to mount a very uh, sort of uh, a, uh, a labor movement that is critical of the United States because the United States is, is figuring into a perpetuation of neoliberal hegemony and then this filters down into poor working conditions and so on and so forth. It becomes extremely, extremely challenging to, uh, to do that kind of thing. But um, the, you know, I think it's an uneven process uh, to SL's question. I think that, you know, we can talk about the decline of political liberalism and clearly we're in a moment right now where, and Emil referred to this, right, with the United States uh, in somewhat of a, in somewhat disarray, right, you know, needing to get its own sort of democratic liberal house in order uh, first. Um, we're clearly at a moment where the pendulum has swung one way, but I think that that actually may bode reasonably well for the future in the following sense. I mean, if you happen to be a fan, even a qualified fan of political liberalism in the sense of you know, individual freedoms, uh, which I am. Um, and that is that um, what we're seeing is a, a, I think a decoupling of the United States as a symbol from the ideas of individual freedoms, human rights protections, um, uh, democratic elections on the other, right? 
when people take to the to to the streets in Myanmar about um, you know not particularly liking that their brethren are being slaughtered or be, or that the military has orchestrated a coup, I don't think that has much to do, if anything, to do with the United States. I think that has to do with the people of Myanmar not liking, for their own very understandable reasons, this kind of this kind of outcome. I think that we're still dealing with a very long hangover of this. Uh, conflation of the United States as an actor and as a symbol with liberalism as a, a political liberalism as an idea. And I think that decoupling could actually generate very interesting politics uh, going forward. Um, I think I'll end there. Although Eric McGlinchey, I've not forgotten your question. I just couldn't figure out how to weave it in. So we'll see if I can next. Good, thank you so much. There are a lot of, of different questions with, with sometimes very deep conceptual uh, aspects. There was a, a very a more policy-oriented question that I really would like to give you that is coming from uh, Ambassador Dick Holland, who was uh, ambassador, as you know, in the region and a public diplomacy officer, and who was telling or reminding us that one of the best US programs, even if it's a, a long-term one, are everything related to educational exchange. And so the question is that what other public diplomacy program would, would you recommend? So that the kind of the policy side of your book, based on your analysis, which kind of public diplomacy program would you recommend for the US to try to rebuild legitimacy or recouple uh, uh, the US by itself and, and uh, liberal values on the other side? And then there was another question, in fact, several questions about the, um, would you say that about the, the war in Afghanistan as potentially having an impact on the way Central Asians are looking at the US. And if you think the war in Afghanistan had an impact, which aspect of the war? Is that the war itself, like being on the ground and fighting? Is that the nation building failing or not failing prospect in, in, uh, in Afghanistan? Or is that the Manas Transit Center that was a huge issue for Kyrgyzstan? So, so two questions, one on the policy side and one on the in a sense, another aspect of the policy side, which is the, the war in Afghanistan. Okay, excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, I still can't figure out a way to weave in an answer to Eric McGlinchey's question. So I'll just say extremely briefly um, that Eric, we can talk about this more later, but um, you know, the, the slowness is really on the front end. I guess it's the independent variables for the, for the most part. Although I would say that the, the book is really about process more than it is about outcome. I, I'm, there are outcomes in, in politics, absolutely for sure. Um, but I think that we tend to, um, uh, even those outcomes are part of larger processes. And so I, I really wanted to pinpoint the, 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 the process and take stock of it and you know, read the book and tell me if you're convinced and we can, we can chat about it later. But that's, uh, that would be my short answer to that. Um, so to the other questions, uh, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, again, it links to Emil's comment about the concreteness or the lack of concrete in, involvement of, of the United States in, in, the, in the region, right? You know, what are the specific kinds of policy prescriptions? What would make a difference in terms of U.S. re-engagement in the, in, in the region, assuming the political will and, and, the, and the funding and so on and so forth? Um, you know, for another project, I'm, I, I've, I've looked at how Central Asians receive messaging, um, uh, whether they're swayed by certain kinds of framing or other. I think Marlene and Eric, we've talked about this before in another context. Um, one of the things that we found is that, you know, framing efforts, like people aren't really convinced. They're, their opinions don't shift at all when it concerns something that they can touch, see, and feel, and sense, right? If it's right in front of their noses, if it's concrete and material, you know, no effort at, at framing, I was, that might be too strong, but efforts at framing seem to fail, right? And so um, this is where the, the, the more concrete, this is an answer to Dick's good question. I mean, the more concrete and visible the activity, but also I would say circumscribed and uh, clearly public goods generating, um, the, I think the more effective um, they would be, which is why building a road, if you're, you know, uh, no matter what people may think about China in general, if people need a road and they can continue to benefit from that road, assuming it doesn't degrade too quickly, right, then, um, then, that, then that, that, that I think is essentially effective use of, of resources. Um, in another context, um, 
Um, Colleen Wood, who's, who works on Kyrgyzstan as a PhD student, has talked about the value of the Peace Corps. I mean, she was in the Peace Corps, um, and, uh, but I think, that the, I think the Peace Corps is, is a terrific example, and re-engagement there would be, I think, maybe that's a low-hanging fruit, but bringing the Peace Corps back into, uh, in ways that are sure to, um, to help people to encounter actual Americans, Rather than the idea of the the uh, rather than the idea of of America, hopefully actual Americans providing concrete help out of an ethic of care, right? Rather than something else, uh, if those things can be achieved, you know, the more concrete, uh, the more concrete and on the ground, the better, uh, because the on the ideas front, it at least the moment we're in right now, it actually leads to questions about the intention of the United States, you know, questions about potential hypocrisy of the United States, ulterior motives and those kinds of things. And I think that the US needs to um, take those concerns and those questions and those perceptions really seriously. So the war in Afghanistan, um, I don't know. I mean, I do deal with the Soviet Afghan war and its impact on how people uh, imagine the United States during the Soviet period, late Soviet period. But um, I don't deal with the Afghan war, uh, except maybe in passing in, in the book. But let me just offer some things. I think it really is more the story that you started to allude to, Marlene, at the end there. The story of um, the ancillary activities that are associated with mounting this military campaign and setting aside the, you know, the rightness or wrongness of, the, of, of how the campaign was carried out on the, on the military side and how, it's, how it affected Afghanistan proper. I think that it's perceived in, in the region as initially, um, even if it's initially welcomed um, be, in the interest of providing some kind of stability, because we need to remember that there, were, there was broad concern about the Talibanization or something like that, right? Even if the Taliban never intended to you know, do anything outside of Afghanistan, the, the, the concern was there, certainly in Tajikistan and, and in Uzbekistan, exaggerated for political effect and all that, but, but nonetheless, that was an overriding concern. But it becomes something else later on. It becomes a story of the US um, uh, having no exit plan, not particularly stabilizing the, the region, um, and then uh, empowering through various kinds of patronage networks, um, lots of local actors who uh, seem to be ensnared in fairly corrupt schemes, right? So it ends up being kind of, uh, you know, at, at best a wash on the sort of military campaign side, but then, uh, the, but, but then a negative, I think, in terms of how it uh, affects, uh, let's say, Kyrgyz society with regard to Manas. I mean, Uzbekistan is a little uh, a little different because you don't see the active civil society and the and the and the great attention paid to, um, you know, um, schemes of patronage and 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 so on. But it could be that a similar thing was happening behind the scenes. It's just hard to it's hard to uncover that um, in any great detail. So yeah, feed the perception of feeding corruption. I could have said this more clearly. The perception of feeding corruption, I think, does the U.S. no favors in the region. That's. I think a wonderful point to bring our discussion to a conclusion. It was really a wonderful uh, uh, talk and I wanted to once again to congratulate you Ed for the publication of the book and Emil for commenting. Very useful and, and, and really deep, deep comment and thank you for everybody being so active in the, in the chat box. Let me just say very briefly that we will continue having a, a book launch discussion on March 10. We will be discussing Dania Khudai Birginova, latest book toward nationalizing regime, conceptualizing power and identity in the post-Soviet dream. And on the 15th, we will have another book launch on pipes, dreams, water and empire in Central Asia, Arad Sea Basin. So many great publications on their way with the region. So that's great news. Thank you again, Ed and Emil, for this great conversation and uh, wishing you, all of you, to be good and safe. Thank you so much and hope Thank to you. see you soon. Thank you, Ed. Thank, Thank you, you Emil. Bye-bye.